Hello and welcome to chapter 7 of the Complete King's Indian Defense Masterclass. Today we're looking at the Four Pawns, which is a very aggressive and ambitious option you might see. It's this move f4 on move 5 that white can go for, gaining a ton of center control, but as you're going to see, these pawns end up being a little overextended, a little flimsy, and very vulnerable. And so we're going to play this in a very similar way that we approach the other sidelines, and that means we're going for a c5-based approach. As always, we're going to look at all the main lines that you need to know, as well as covering a couple of the game examples. We have three games specifically to look at, and as always, there is also a PGN file in the description if you want to follow along. So, black castles here. And then we go c5. As always, we first castle and then go c5. And white is again um, immediately forced to make a committal decision. Do they take here or do they push? And these are again two fundamentally different approaches. Now, pushing uh, again leads to a Benoni type of structure. And I say again because this is very similar to the previous chapter uh, where we looked at the same ish and we have similar plans. We have a6, b5. We have e6, we're playing uh, kind of on the queen side and in the center. So e6 is the move here. They're going to take, they don't really have the luxury of keeping the tension here because if they play a move like bishop to e2, unfortunately, we can actually just take this pawn and after they take back, there's going to be too much pressure on this pawn. They can't really uh, defend it without moving the bishop again, which they don't want to do. Uh, if they push this pawn, we can just take and go knight g4. And this is what I meant by these pawns look good, but they're very overextended and are going to be susceptible to various different attacks. So here, there's too much pressure on the pawn. They're going to have to give it away. They can go e6. This is the most advantageous way for them to, to give up the pawn. But nonetheless, they give up a pawn and we are very happy here. So going backwards, uh, they can't go bishop e2. And bishop d3 similarly is not very possible. We have a, a very similar idea of going rook e8. And after they castle, we can now play uh, the move c4, which if they take, distracts their bishop away from the center. And if they move back, gives us this c5 square for our knight to go ahead and occupy. There's also knight b4 ideas. So they can go a3, but now knight c5. And the knight is sinking into the position Um I mean, this is becoming very difficult to navigate. In fact, we're already much better here. After they take queen to b6 check, bishop to e3, we can take this one. Now we're hitting the queen. There's this pin. The bishop is attacked twice. We are completely, completely winning. So going backwards, this is going to explain why after e6 they're forced to take. But this is in many ways a concession because we actually take with the f pawn. And now we open up the f file and give our rook a very purposeful uh, experience now in the game where it's always going to be exerting a pretty decent amount of pressure in the position. So bishop d3, we go knight c6, they castle, we can plant that knight in the center with knight d4, supernatural moves, they're going to go knight g5, they're going to try to generate some sort of play. The knight here is a pretty strong piece, um, it's exerting some pressure on our light squares, but it's not actually doing anything too concrete, and we can continue by more or less ignoring it. We go e5. We do surrender this d5 square, but in exchange, we are opening up our bishop. We are, you know, cementing in our knight further in the center of the board, um, and we've already more than equalized. I mean, objectively, we are doing completely fine here. f5 was played in the game that we're following. This is h6 now. This is, by the way, Kasparov with the black side, played in 1982, quite a while ago. Now we have a trade on f5 twice, and now b5. And you can see that black is focused solely on the center slash king side, but now you see that secondary part of the Benoni or Banco positions where you go for expansions also on the queen side. So once again, we're getting a holistic game where it's it's in our best interest to play on both sides of the board. Um, the reason, by the way, that you know white doesn't really want to take here is that we can take back and their pawn structure becomes really weak. But even worse, look at this. I mean, we have a huge center control, which is really ironic because if you recall, we're looking at the four pawns. So they're the ones that started with the huge center. But again, it's difficult to maintain that center. And you see that very, very highlighted in this position here. So b5, we have bishop to e3 in the game. We had takes, takes, king to h8, takes, takes, knight comes to d5. We had a couple of trades. Uh, eventually, black ended up winning the rook on f1. 
Uh, but in exchange, white tried to go for some compensation with an attack here, but it's no match. I mean, queen to d7, very simply, puts pressure on f5, defends the mate, and we're doing perfect. Rook to f1, d3. Now going and trying to make some concrete threats um, of black's own right, trying to, to attack and put pressure. We had queen to f3, we had d2 here, we have g4, rook to c8, threatening to bring the rook to c1 and expand further, queen d3, queen a4. Um, and, you know, this end game here is completely winning for black. Even though the pawns look quite weak, the issue for, for black, um, the issue for white rather, is that this idea of rook c1 is simply unstoppable. Um, uh, knight to f4, rook to e8, now rook to e1 is also coming, and this pawn is going to simply decide the game. There is no way to stop that. Rook to c1, bishop f6, now activating the bishop into the game, ideas of kind of maneuvering it towards the area where the, the action is actually happening. We had rook to e5, uh, takes, takes. And in this final position, notice that black is still up the exchange. We still have some pretty dangerous pawns. And eventually, uh, white took the pawn on d4, marched down to d5, um, but rook to f4, and finally resigned. Because if you take, takes, there's no way that this pawn is promoting. Simple king to g7. And the knight, the second it moves, we promote. And we're going to win the game with complete, complete confidence. So now let's look at d take c5, which is the better, more accurate and precise approach that white can go for. We go queen a5 here. And after bishop to d3, defending the pawn, which was now hit, we simply take back the pawn with uh, the queen. We don't want to really take back the pawn with our pawn because then we forfeit some control in the center and we allow ideas of e5, for example. So we want to be precise here. We take back with the queen. And yes, at some point, this will allow the queen to be hit with tempo. But by the time that that happens, we've already developed our pieces more into the game. So bishop e3, we're fine with this, right? Queen a5, it's okay. Let them castle, let them get their king safe. That's okay with us, bishop g4, because we're truthfully getting uh, good play. And this is a position that's roughly equal. I mean, white has a little bit of uh, a practical advantage with control in the center, but we're, you know, very quick to take that back. There's ideas of this maneuver, knight d7, knight c5, and hitting the bishop. There's ideas of, you know, opening up the bishop with that same idea, getting the rook to put pressure on c4. We have just as many ideas as white does. And again, I think that both players have, have something to play for here. So bishop b1, knight to a4, continuing our approach and, and play on the queen side. Knight takes, queen takes, and b3. And here, actually, the, we're following two games before the move b3. And in one of those games, the move king h1 was played. Um, and this actually allowed for a pretty nice game. In this other game, the move b3 was played, and as you're going to very shortly see, white kind of forced the issue by playing c5, and they went for an end game, which actually tactically is quite beautiful. You give away the queen as black, but then win it right back. So they went for this end game that's very drawish. I mean, there's no player that can claim an advantage, and you'll see that the position completely dissipates into nothing but equality, and, uh, you know, both players eventually shook hands because the game is completely drawn and equal and they both went home which as black is not a bad result but i think that you know that that shows that with the four pawns i mean white can go for for these more drawish end games but that's not the the mentality that they want when they play f4 they want to run us over so simplifying the board into these end games is not something that they they're going to do um, with a happy face. I mean, they're going to, to play this only if it's necessary. And why is this necessary? Well, let's look at king h1. Black essentially is going to get good play here. The bishop, the queen, the knight, the rook, these pieces will activate an attack over here on the queen side. So e6 first, restricting and slowing down the pressure that white has in the center. h4, the knight comes to e7. One idea now is eventually to expand at some point with f5 or d5 with the knight supporting it. Um, and you'll see f5 coming on the board, queen to h4, king f7, a nice move actually, running the king out of danger and also setting up some bishop f6. And in, the, in preparation essentially of this h file opening up where we don't want our king anywhere near that h file, we also want the rook to have the privilege of situating itself on h8 and going from there. So b5, 
you'll see a mix of play from, from Black here. This is, by the way, following a second game, which was Hikaru Nakamura with the black side. The first game that we looked at um, previously was Kasparov with the black side. And so Hikaru here decided to play on both sides of the board, right? You see this idea of king f7, bishop f6, but you also see this idea of playing b4, uh, playing for b5 and queen takes b5 and playing uh, holistically again, which I think is an important concept. Often what you'll end up seeing is that when you play c5, you have this attachment to the queen side because this is what the move c5 really signifies. You're playing for queen a5, you're playing for some queen side pressure, but that's not necessary. Um, and often the best options, the best approaches are to play on both sides of the board, restricting the play that white has by this idea of going f5. That was a really creative approach to slow down and in fact completely stop the attack that white was trying to build up. So bishop a7, the rook infiltrates. We now have rook to g8, uh, potentially hinting at opening up the, the g file, but also potentially going for g5 and expanding like that. The rook ended up coming to c8, so neither of those options, but, you know, still, it forced the issue on the, the king side with h6 now being forced. We have rook to e1, both players shuffling around. Black is not winning here, I want to emphasize this, but black has complete, you know, a completely fine game. Both players, as I like to say, have something to play for. We have e takes f5, knight to e7, reactivating, and d5, right? This pawn begins to march down the board. This is one of uh, Black's huge benefits in this position. Rook to b2, hitting the queen. The queen moves. And now d4, right? The, the pawn continues to launch. We have rook to c1. Uh, a nice idea because if you just take twice and then take the bishop, then they're going to promote. So you have to be careful. You have to watch out for your opponent's ideas. But simply queen takes a7. And the position continues to simplify and clarify. We have queen to e7. Rook to b6, queen to c7, shuffling around a little bit. And the bishop and the queen are strong. I mean, white has active pieces, but they're down a pawn. And so objectively, uh, you know, white is okay, but it's a very dynamic position. It's an imbalanced position. White has a little less material, but a bit more activity. Essentially, this knight here is, is a little bit slow to get into the game. You've seen it shuffle around the entire board. Uh, so that's kind of where uh, white is claiming some level of compensation. But as you're going to see, all of that compensation gets wiped out of the board the second that that sleeping knight gets traded for the beautiful bishop on c4. And now there is no excuse, there's no compensation at all for the, the material deficit that white is seeing themselves in. And I mean, very simply, you avoid the checks, you avoid the attacks, and... Uh, queen takes h6, seals the game. Notice the rook is safe for the time being because of the pin. And after the queen moves, rook to f8. You kind of huddle your pieces a little just to regroup. And now you're ready to continue to pounce on the opponent, um, which black eventually does do. After queen to a8, you're threatening to trade the queens. If the queen just moves somewhere random, there's also this idea of going for the fork. There's the idea of trading the rooks with rook to e8. If the queen doesn't defend that square, so it has many different squares that it needs to defend, too many to actually defend, and white, recognizing this, decided to resign here, and black won the game. So that's going to end the video here for today. There isn't that much theory with the four pawns, at least comparative to the other variations that we looked at. It's more so these ideas of playing on both sides of the board, expanding early on with c5, this is my recommendation, and essentially either getting an improved version of the Benoni, as I will show with d5, we're playing for e6, we're playing for a6, b5, we get an improved version of the Benoni because in the Benoni, white doesn't end up going for f4, at least not this early on usually. Uh, so we get a nice variation of the Benoni, or if they take, as I mentioned, queen a5, the important move to remember, basically the only important move to remember, where now Queen takes c5 is on the horizon, and we're getting good play on both sides of the board. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you subscribe. If you're new around here, like this video. If you learned something new from it, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.